happy Father's Day to all the fathers. The big hand to all the fathers. Come on, everybody. Yay! Yay! Fathers. Mothers get so much credit, right? Fathers, though, have an extremely important role in a child's life. But let's start with just a verse. There's, there's really a lot of verses. But I want to start with 1 Timothy 2.8. It says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy ha hands without anger or quarreling. Men's attitudes, men's hearts submitted to the Lord and their family in prayer, establishing their life in fatherhood. One night a wife found her husband standing over their newborn baby's crib. Silently she watched him. And he stood looking down at the small child sleeping. And she saw on his face a mixture of emotions. Disbelief, doubt, delight, amazement, enchantment, and skepticism. <clears throat> he would stand back and shake his head and say, amazing, oh, smiling, big smile. <clears throat> and touched by his emotional display, she put her arms around him and said, honey, a penny for your thoughts. And he said, honey, isn't it amazing when you take time to look really, really close how can anyone make a crib for $49.99? <laughs> it made me think of Ikea when I, I read this. Such a man thing, very practical. Wow, did we get a deal on this? The wood alone costs more. But, when we <laughs> but as fathers, when, when a man or a woman sees a newborn baby, it is a miracle. It's God working to bring forth life. And it's funny how we always think of all the difficulty of pregnancy, and that is something men don't understand. And it seems like it has great difficulty and great joy involved. But for men, there is an awesomeness and responsibility and love and fear of raising up these children the right way. A lot is put on the father because that's God's plan. The father has an amazingly powerful role in the family. We're going to go over some of those roles today. But men throughout history have been seen to be great examples of fathers. We often talk about, well, different periods of time, men would be really affectionate or other times, you know, don't cry if you're a man. And so they, they wouldn't show enough emotion. And then some would say, today, men are showing too much emotion. I would say a man sustained by the word of God shows the right emotion at the right time. Led by the spirit as the spirit leads to demonstrate all the different natures that God has given to us to show and exemplify what we're feeling and what we're doing. In Proverbs 4, it says, Watch over your heart with, with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. I said, God sets a man to show just what is required at just the right time. In Luke 6, 45, it says, The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from which, that which fills the heart. A father seeing their child is filled with joy and happiness and awe. And you meet a, a father of a new child and they're handing you cigars, but they're talking about their baby. It's amazing that God would use men 
as frail and dumb as we are sometimes, to be the instruments to raise something that he formed for a purpose in the womb. But he has. And God doesn't make mistakes like that. If we weren't the right tool, we wouldn't be used. But men, we are. And God is perfect in setting us up in that position. But he allows us to also take on that responsibility to do it right. In the verse I read you, it says, lift up holy hands without anger or disputing or quarreling. This can only happen truly with a man who has established his relationship with the Lord. A man who humbly comes and reverently comes before the Lord. Not a man who thinks the Lord should accept them because they're that man. But as we just read, out of the heart the mouth speaks, we're also understanding that a good father and a good husband has a humbleness to him in the role that was given to him by the Lord. We are to be men of faith, men of self-control, men who control our emotions, yet stand firm in what we know to be true. Men who understand what it means to have an intimate relationship with our Savior. Jack Hayford, a pastor, says, it's as if God, it's as if God drank coffee and you'd feel comfortable coming to him and you'd pour him a cup and then as you sat there, you'd pour out your heart as well. Imagine just the two of you, God and one of his children, sitting there over coffee as friends, sharing the deepest thoughts of your heart. <laughs> we always understand God reverently and we should. And we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but the, at the same time, God wants a relationship Whereas the example of Abba Father, like we sang today, we're like the child that he's holding, that's sitting on his knee talking to him, telling him our joys, our happiness, our fears. And he's there to comfort us and lead us and guide us in all these things. And Jesus said, come all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, laden and I will give you rest. Fathers and mothers, as we struggle with raising our children, walking through this life, setting up our homes and our families, if we walk with the Lord, He's with us. He gives us rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. it starts that by saying, Come to me, all who labor. In Re Revelation twenty two seventeen, it says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Understanding this establishes a way a husband and a father treats their child. Showing them the Savior. Showing them an understanding of the word. Showing them that they can have a personal and loving relationship with their creator. Jesus says in John 15, 15, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. You are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father would give you whatever you ask for using my name. So to begin having a face-to-face -face relationship with Christ establishes a man in this, in this world, in his roles, in his family, and in the workplace. If you remember Paul saying in 1 Corinthians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he continues by saying, the head of every man is Christ. The head of of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. These roles were established before the foundation of the world, men and women, knowing that we have a position to fill, husbands 
and fathers. It's not that fathers are perfect. Fathers do things that don't always lead to success. I'm reminded of a story of Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. When Paul probably, in, in one instance, had some rights to have reservations, but on the other hand, was probably not as forgiving as he should have been. In Acts 13, 13, Paul and Barnabas are traveling, and John Mark was with them, and he left them and returned to Jerusalem. Well, this upset Paul. I don't know if he was just feeling he couldn't trust him in the work or if his pride was injured. But in a couple chapters later, when Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them as they were going back to preach through the cities, Paul said no. And Barnabas and John Mark went one way and Paul went another. Now, as fathers, as men, we do have disagreements. But it's important for us, as we understand who we are in Christ, to begin with prayer, to begin with the word, and decide, is this the right action we should take? And when we make a mistake, to recognize that and seek to remedy and right it, as Paul later does with John Mark. Being a man, being a father, being a husband doesn't mean you get everything right. But it does mean you're able to recognize what you got wrong and how you can fix it as an example, especially for your children and for your wife and for your coworkers and those who know you. Let's start with the idea of the father as a spiritual leader in the home. We'll compare him in a way to an Old Testament priest. In Job 1.5, we read, when these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. Job loved his children so much, he cared for them so much, he would petition to God for them. This should think about, have you think about our great high priest who petitions the Father for us. Just as in the Old Testament system, the priest petitioned God for Israel. But this practice of Job established before the tabernacle system set up the pattern that God had put in his heart for every father to follow. Pray for, praying for their children. Petitioning the Lord for their safety, for their guidance, for their direction, for their walk with him. Interceding in their struggles. Talk about Jesus. He does it now in heaven. He did it on earth. If you remember in Luke 22, 31, Jesus is talking to Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And then Jesus says, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon that your faith should not fail, so that when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthened, strengthen your brothers. But if you get this, Jesus says, I know that Satan is going to attack you, and I have pleaded in prayer for you. Not that it shouldn't happen, but that, their faith, that his faith should be strong during the sifting. He's interceding for him to make sure he can stand against the attacks of the enemy. In Hebrews 4.14, we're told about Jesus being the great high priest who entered heaven. In 4.15, a high priest that understands our weaknesses. And then in 4.16, it says, so that we may boldly 
come before the throne of grace of our gracious God. We will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Think about that as a father. Not only interceding for your child, but having grace for your child. And even in their mistakes, so that they know they can come to you. And you might discipline them, but you won't condemn them with anger and hate. But take them before the Lord. Show them the biblical error of their ways and work with them to grow and get better. A, a, a biblical father is one who instructs. Just like a priest. The priests and prophets both were mouthpieces for the Lord. Both of them would help to guide the people. They would instruct the people in the way of the word and how they were to act. You know, seeking the Lord is something every instructor must do. Seeking the wisdom of the knowledge of what they want to teach. If it's a teacher, they should make sure they have the best textbooks, ones that are the most accurate. If you're teaching a skill or a hobby, you should be very proficient in it, and you've learned it from others and often from books. If you're a father in a Christian home, you are teaching from the Word of God, and you're seeking the Lord and the Holy Spirit. David, in 1 Samuel, was seeking and inquiring of God. He also used Abiathar. But he sought the Lord because his men were bitter about losing their sons and daughters. This was in the middle of uh, a kidnapping, basically, and they were going to get them. And they all got angry, and they talked about stoning David. David had a lot of ups and downs. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Could you imagine that? His men were so distraught for their wives and daughters being, and their sons being kidnapped. They were going to go get them. They were so mad about it, they were thinking of killing David. And it says, but David found strength in the Lord. And then he said to Abiathar, bring me the ephod. And David asked of the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord said, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. Well, we don't have the Aram and the Therum. And we don't have the ephod. But we have the Holy Spirit much, much greater. We have God himself living in us and the completed word to guide us. Even in a situation where we might be considered at fault, we seek the Lord in comfort and the Lord gives us guidance to lead and instruct in the way that we should go for our children and our family. It might be at work. It might be in many areas. But God wants men of God, fathers of God, to be ones who lead by instructing others. Deuteronomy 6.4 Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Lead and instruct. He continues, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road and when you're going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your houses and on your gates. The word of the Lord should be everywhere in your home and in your life. Wherever you go, people should be able to say that man loves the Lord and he's teaching his children the ways of God. It should be so obvious that anyone can see that you are rightly instructing your child. Probably you're all thinking in Proverbs 22. I'm going to read it in the NLT. Direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. 
the benefits of training in God's word. Proverbs 13, 24 shows the consequences of not training them in God's word. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. The great discipliner is God who loves his children so much he will correct us to bless us. In fact, it's one of the greatest things about walking him is his correcting hand. Just like a father to his children. Just like a father who loves his children enough to discipline them. There's nothing mistaken in those words. Those who hate their children do not discipline them. Those who love their children discipline them. And they discipline them in an understanding of how God has disciplined them. To guide, to instruct, which leads to them being a leader. A man is to be a leader in his home to his children. A leader in the church. Not only should he have these traits of a man who has shown himself to be approved, able to rightly divide the word of truth, but able to disciple other men. Able to teach other men. Qualification of an elder is one who can teach. But men, all men should be striving in the word to be able to mentor, disciple, teach, instruct, and lead other men properly in the word of God. That role was given to the men in the church. It needs to start in the church and in the home with their families. You know, we have men who are leaders of industry, million-dollar CEOs, and all they have are broken homes because they don't properly spend the right amount of time doing one thing over the other. They allow their homes to collapse saying, oh, I'm doing this for success, of providing for my family. Providing for your family is in work, which a man is required to do, is only part of it. Leading your family by being there, loving them, guiding them, showing them what it means to not only love, properly work, spend time in the word, is just as important as the amount of money they bring in. Also, and most importantly for a leader, is to have the strength of their convictions. Not to vacillate, not to waver, but to understand the arguments and stand firm in what they have decided will happen or what they will do. Strength of your convictions as a man is very important. It's not that you always have the right answer, but you are always seeking and striving to do your best through the wisdom God has given you and the wisdom of the Word and of the Holy Spirit to make that right decision. You don't do it haphazardly. You seek guidance. It's essential as a quality of a leader to be able to be decisive when necessary because people are looking at you to do that. You know, Jesus was meek and meek does not mean weak. If you remember in Matthew 21, <laughs> he starts knocking over the money changers' tables. And what's he say? He says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. He starts by giving the basis for the reason for his action. It is written in the word of God and you are violating it and I am here to stop that. Leading by example, the strength of the word of God and the action required at that moment. Not vacillating, but having enough without too much. Just the right amount of action, which can only come from our understanding and our walk with the Lord. As we look at today and every day, 
Not just today, but every day. Fathers, are you praying enough for your family? Are you praying enough for your children? Are you praying enough for your wife? Are you praying enough for your church body? Are you interceding the way that you should? Are you spending time with the Lord? Are you spending time with your children, growing them up in the word, teaching them, showing them stories, reading with them, simple things like Bible apps, books, storybooks, the kind we hand out so that your children will understand how important Jesus is in your home. In Ephesians 6, Paul says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on earth. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. A father is a disciplinarian, and he is a leader and an instructor, just like a priest in the home. We have a role, men, a God-ordained role that we are to take on that mantle with humility, but with service and desire to make sure we are leading We're also called providers. Do you know we are providers for the home? The man's job, one of their main jobs is to provide. Right there in Genesis, the man is to toil the soil, all the, toil with the soil all the days of his life to make sure he can provide for his family. God gives us great joy in work. He gives us joy in being able to provide what is needed. It's all a gift from God. Even the labor. The work is a gift from the Lord if it's taken in the right perspective. I just gave examples of CEOs who are never home. They spend more time with their secretaries than their wives and who do they end up leaving with? Their secretaries. Then they get a new secretary and it just happens again and again. Instead of spending the right amount of time with their wife and their family in prayer and leading, they think if I provide enough, I've done my job. It's only part of the equation. It's not all of it. In Philippians 4, Paul is talking. And he says, at the moment, all I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me from Epaphroditus, they are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God our Father forever and ever. Amen. It's interesting. God will supply all our needs. And yes, he does. But we are not to be lazy. We are to be active. We are to be providing. We are to be working. If God was to supply for one of the greatest apostles in just how much of the Bible we have, Paul would not have been a tent maker. He would not have been asking for churches to help other churches. God would have given all the churches everything they need. Yet what do we have here? Finance, treasurer, tithing. Yet we still see God's miracle hand by providing for this church and churches all over. When you think you can't do it, you see God's hand providing. But it doesn't mean that we aren't working to make this church strong and fixing things that break, praying for the community, going out and trying to make ourselves known, working through his word, through his scripture, growing the body. And that's just work inside the church. We haven't even gone home yet. We haven't even gone to our place of work, whatever it is, from a CEO to a plumber. It doesn't matter. You're providing for your home and your family. And all the glory goes to the Lord. And he is working with you in that supply. We've all seen it in our lives. 
They're like, how are we ever going to do this? How will this ever happen? How are we going to pay for this? What about our bills? What about this, that, and the other thing? And then we see God's hand of provision. And it's not like we just sat there on the couch and did nothing. We were working to try and make things happen and work, and the Lord provides. This church alone has seen gifts that we can't even imagine. They're like, wow, the Lord provided here, here, and here. They're not all financial. I'm not saying that. Many of them are. But just amazing things people have done or given to the church. God is so good. And a lot of times, the Lord waits right till the end so that we see his glory. I told you about Westbourne Baptist Church. That was my church in England. The day before they had to sell, a man comes in who was a contractor and said, if you give me the top section of a new build, I will rebuild the whole part of your church and put two storefronts so that you'll have continual income and you'll own all that and I'll just build some condos. Now granted, these condos were like three million pounds a piece and he built six of them, I think. They were gorgeous. The day before, they were going to lose the church. They'd been praying. They were trying to get loans. <laughs> and it's, one, it's an amazingly beautiful church. And the inside now is it's gorgeous. Well, do you think they, they know that was all of God? Absolutely. It was just amazing how God worked for them. God does that kind of thing all the time. But they were, they were doing everything they could. God was seen in the glory of coming in and saying, I see you're striving. I see you're working. Let's get this done together. But you'll see my mighty hand in the way that this finally plays out. So the father is instructor, leader, priest, in the sense that he does the guidance. He is the one who's the intercessor. He's also, as we said, the provider. Physically, he provides with money. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. God's very clear in our job that we are to provide. Galatians 6, Paul says, So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those of the household of faith. Let us be givers. Let us be ones who share in what the Lord has given to us. We are to be physical providers. We are to be emotional providers, men. I know this is hard, right? Men, don't show your emotions. Of course we're to show our emotions. Men have emotions. I know women. You're thinking, eh, it ain't so. It is. We care. We love. We're happy. We're sad. There's nothing wrong with that. We are to emotionally encourage, build up our children, our wives. Ephesians 6, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Mm. It is right for children to obey. But parents, we need to deserve that respect. Just like we can't be forced to respect someone, your children can't be forced to respect you. Respect doesn't come by being forced. Respect is something innate when they see what you do for them and how you work for them and how you live your life. Honor and respect is such a gift that God gives to the hearts of children when they see their fathers and their mothers performing as a father and mother should and having affection and caring and loving and guiding and teaching and interceding. We ought to, to help them intellectually. My father was a, a math genius. He is a math genius. It was hard to ask him questions sometimes because he would skip six steps and then say, what, you don't see it? Well, you skip six steps. 
I don't see it. <laughs> In his head, it was like, oh, and done. We needed another two pages. But <laughs> I always respected that ability of his to be able to do that. God gave him an amazing knowledge and understanding. I tell you what, I remember, you, God gives everyone different gifts. My father was a PhD chemist, a chemical engineer. So math and chemistry. And I <laughs> had to give a presentation. I don't remember what it was in chemistry class. Not only did my father walk me and my partner through the whole thing, he said, and here's every question your teacher will ask. And here's the answer. My teacher was dumbfounded because he asked every question and we had perfect answers that weren't in the book. And he was like, he asked, he asked did you get help with this? <laughs> that was my father helping us going, okay, I'll help you with this. Of course, we got a great grade. But everyone has fathers with gifts that have helped you with certain things. Yeah, like, thanks, Dad. Intellectually helping you grow. Proverbs 2, 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. God wants us to have knowledge. The Lord wants us to reason. And not only reason with him, reason together in our growth. Intellectual growth. God gave us minds to use. Remember in Acts 22, Paul is talking and he says, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicilia, brought up in the city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. Paul said, the Lord allowed me to be taught by the best of the best in the law. Luke was a doctor. Now, did he use Peter a fisherman incredibly, just like he used Luke? Yes, but, he, but there's differences. If it weren't for Luke, we wouldn't have such a detailed history because he was very meticulous. Without Paul's legal mind, which Gamaliel had a lot to do with, we wouldn't be able to have our dialectic treatises that we have in Galatians and Romans that are just powerful for us to be able to understand what it means to be saved in a Christian. God says, knowledge is good. I gave you a mind. Fathers, teach your children. Proverbs 18.5 says, The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of the wise seek it. Teach your children to seek. Teach your children it's important to grow intellectually. Have wise words. Proverbs 13 says, Wise words will win you a good meal, but treacherous people have an appetite for violence. Those who control their tongue will have long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. Lazy people want much but get little, but those who work hard will prosper. Working hard. Working hard not only physically, intellectually, emotionally, directionally, directionally, leading. Men, it's a lot of work. God didn't say, okay, you're saved. Do nothing. He said, now it begins. Every day, it's a joyous trial for a father, for a husband. Seeking to make sure we are serving the Lord in all the roles that he's given us. Hmm. I'm going to read an application point in Proverbs 11. It says, Proverbs 11, 5, the godly are directed by honesty. The wicked fall beneath their load of sin. The godliness of good people rescues them. The ambition of treacherous people traps them. When the wicked die, their hopes die with them for they rely on their own feeble strength. The godly are rescued from trouble and it falls on the wicked instead. Fathers and mothers, raising your child to know the Lord saves from all that wickedness falling upon them eternally. 
your direction and your guidance and your leading and your teaching and your growing will make that child understand who Jesus is and what they must do to humbly come to him and serve him. The duty of a, a father is to imitate Christ, to imitate the father. In Jeremiah 31, God says, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with an unfailing love I have drawn you to myself. Fathers, are you doing that with your children? Are you loving them with an everlasting love, with an unfailing love, doing everything you can to teach them rightly so they understand and respect you because they know you only have blessing and goodness in mind for them? How do we know that kind of love? We know it from John 3, 16. For God, he loved the world. How much? To send his own son to perish so that we would have eternal life. You know, when you tell your parents, you, I mean your children, you love them. When you discipline your children in love, when you guide them in love, when you show them the word and the walk and your walk and your actions so they can see it in love, you are blessing them more than they will ever know because it's a godly blessing. You're changing the direction of their eternal soul with your actions. God will reward us for raising, discipling, and mentoring others especially within our own family. Galatians 6, 9 says, So let us not get tired of doing what is good. Why would we ever tire of doing what is good? For at the right time, we will receive a harvest of blessing if we continue. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially the family of faith. So as we know, all these different things that a father is, the last one is, and there's more, but I, I don't have time. In his home, in his role, he is a protector. The Lord helps him build the house. The Lord helps him keep the house. The Lord helps him guide the house. And he protects that house. In Proverbs, I'm sorry, in Psalm 127, it says, unless the Lord builds a house, the, workers, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. And it goes right into this. Children are a gift from God. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts the, his accusers at the city gates. It starts by saying the house must be, must be built by God. Talking about the family structure. And then he says children are a blessing. They are arrows in the quiver. Are you doing it right? Are you coming for the Lord to have him guide you to protect from the evils of the world, from the arrows of the enemy, from the ideologies of demons on television shows, on talk shows? can't even tell you if you watch The View for any moment of time. That's doctrines of demons left and right. It's something that seems, oh, it would be innocuous. It's so radical. We watch things, I think soap operas. I mean, I don't watch soap operas, but you know the plot. It has to be extreme to keep people's interests. And yet we don't even think about it, what it's influencing, how it's influencing our, our children and our family. It sneaks in. 
But men, we are to protect our family. Guide them. Watch what they watch. Don't watch that. I won't allow it. Or let me put it this. Control what they watch. Not watch what they watch. With them, control what they watch so they don't watch it. You know, uh, Damon sent me a, a video uh, a couple of days, uh, yesterday or the day before, and it's a, a liberal lesbian Jewish Arab woman you, who has adopted children. And she was actually so upset about the left and what they're doing to children. Because she can see that it's not godly. She won't accept God in her life. But she can see the wickedness in it. It's like Bill Maher. Have you listened to him lately? He's seeing the wickedness. Has he accepted God? No. But it's interesting to see that some people are actually going, this has gone too far. In a Christian home? That wall of protection should never even let it get to the point where we have to retract like these people are retracting. It should be the wall is up. This is not allowed. This is wicked. This is wrong. This will not be in my home. Protecting the family. In church, protecting the flock. Not allowing wrong teaching, wrong ideas. Same, uh, same concept in the home. Teaching what is right. Showing the error of what is wrong. Reasoning through with your children. Having them be able to critically think through arguments of the world and come back to scripture and say this is right and this is wrong. Why? Because a man of the Lord is a man of integrity. He's a role model of God in his family and in the church. Micah 6.8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. A man of God is a man of integrity. Walking humbly with the Lord who does what is good and what the Lord requires of him. He is a man who says, I don't care what the world says. I care what God says. And in my home, only what God declares will stand. A man who understands that without the Lord, his house will fall. Isaiah 26, 3 says it this way. You will keep in perfect peace all you who trust in the Lord. All whose thoughts are fixed on the Lord. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. He humbles the proud and brings down the arrogant. He brings it down to the dust. Fathers, you are a high priest in your home. You are the ones your children are looking to for leadership and guidance and instruction and protection. It's a hard job. God didn't make it easy for a reason. There's a lot of work and a lot of labor in it. Setting your priorities right. Working with your wife. demonstrating a life that says, I am a servant of the Most High God. One day we won't have any more time. You won't have time on this earth with your wife to lead her anymore. You won't have time with your children anymore. The die will be cast. The judgment will come. The time is short. It's very short. You know, my, my uncle is celebrating 60 years of marriage. Wow, what a joy. I was, I was reading as I was putting this together, and there's a story about a man who was celebrating 50 years of marriage. 
and understanding that a man leads his home, loves his family, and treats them in the way that Jesus loves and treats them. And the man, the husband wrote that he commented, 50 years is a long time. And the man who had been married for 50 years says, not nearly as long as it would have been without her. God gives us a family. And men, we are to make sure we are leading it right and correctly. There's a poem that goes with this. It says, Just One More Day. It was written by a man named Larry Thompson to honor his wife. Lord, you honored me the moment she came into my life. I had no idea you were preparing her to be my wife. She was so young and innocent and beautiful in every way. We spent our days together. I prayed just one more day. I was so blessed that August day she became my bride. So gracefully she approached the altar to be at my side. I held her tight and whispered, listen to what I say. Loving you forever is not enough. I need just one more day. In our youth we grew in our understanding of love through the laughter, the tears, and blessings from above. Our days full of light, the darkness seemed so far away. You wouldn't sleep without praying, God, just one more day. Lord, just when I thought we couldn't possibly love more, you gave us our children to cherish and adore. They filled our lives with love, such love in every way. Our girls became women, I cried, just one more day. They grow up so fast was the advice we were told. I dismissed their counsel. We were young and they were old. Now I stare at your pictures knowing they're miles away. Stare at their pictures knowing they're miles away. You have no idea what I would give for just one more day. At first glance, it seems so cruel, this cycle of life. I struggle with the aging process, seeing pain and strife. I'm a stranger to my own dad as I hold him and pray. Dear God, if we could just sit and visit one more day. You know, time is short. Men, you have a responsibility before God, before your family, and before others. As you go out this week, make sure that you are praying, saying, Lord, teach me to serve. Teach me to lead. Teach me to intercede. Teach me to be the man of God I'm supposed to be. The husband I'm supposed to be. The father I'm supposed to be. And the church member I'm supposed to be. And lastly, the man in society I'm supposed to be. Make it your mantra. <laughs> Lord, make me the man you would have me be. And watch him work. Because he will. Take that this week. Take it all month. Take it all year. Take it for the rest of your life. Because God is going to make it a question when you get to heaven. I gave you so many opportunities with that family and with that church and with your walk. How did you use it? Were you a good and faithful servant? How many talents do you have to give back to me? Consider that. And be grateful that we're husbands and fathers. What a joy. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you that we can be fathers and mothers. Thank you that we're children to our fathers and, and mothers and grandchildren. Thank you for the cycle of life, even in its difficulties and its hardships, Father. Thank you that we have your blessing, your discipline, your intercession, your leading, your protection, your guidance, and that we can use these things as men and our families to do the same. And all these things, we give you all honor, all praise, and reverent humility. In Jesus' name, amen.